My name is Russ Derry. I'm the Director of Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And the Learn and Share conference call today is on medications for epilepsy. And we're very happy to have with us Dr. Toya Malone, who is an epileptologist with the Bronson Neuroscience Center. So, uh, Dr. Malone, can you just uh, introduce yourself and give a, a brief overview of your experience working as an epileptologist and then uh, also uh, talk a little bit about your clinical and research interests? Sure, no problem. Um, so, as stated, my name is Toya Malone. I'm the epileptologist here at Bronson Neuroscience Center um, at Bronson Methodist Hospital in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, I've been here about a year and a half now. Um, I finished my fellowship training in clinical neurophysiology um, back in November 2011 at Henry Ford, and I've been out here um, in Kalamazoo since December 2011. Um, my experience here at Bronson has been um, actually has been excellent. I've seen lots of different types of epilepsy um, patients that have been controlled, uncontrolled, um, on multiple different medications. Um, I also manage status epilepticus here and um, new onset seizures in our clinic. Um, Research-wise, at the present time, I'm not involved in a lot of research, but my interest is mainly in medications as well as um, improving the overall care of patients with epilepsy, so more from a um, patient education perspective. So I'm actually happy to be on the call with you guys today. Uh, so for the first hour or so, we're going to talk about the medications used for the treatment of epilepsy. Um, we'll break those down into broad-spectrum medications and then also those that are used primarily for partial seizures. Um, today we won't talk a lot about um, dosage, interactions, half-life, the therapeutic blood levels, or mechanisms of action, um, but we'll talk about each medication in particular, sort of what its pros and cons are and um, some of the unique benefits that each one may offer. We also won't talk about every possible side effect. There are lots of side effects that come along with all the anti-seizure medications in general, and mentioning them all will be sort of time-consuming. So we won't go through everything, but the more common side effects we'll definitely discuss. Okay. So we'll start with the broad-spectrum anti-seizure medications. These are medications that typically cover lots of different seizure types, if not all seizure types. Um, there are several medications in this category. To start with the older medications, um, Valproic acid, um, dalvaproic sodium, Depakote, Depakine, um, those are other names that we use for that medication. <coughs> I apologize. But valproic acid is a medication that's been around for a um, multitude of years now, and it's used primarily to treat all seizure types. Um, one of the things about valproic acid is that while it's an excellent anticonvulsant, it does come along with some side effects sort of down the road. Um, one of the bigger ones can be liver toxicity, usually something that's seen earlier on in treatment with the medication, but it can also come up at any time. So we tend to monitor pretty closely for liver function tests um, just to be sure we know what the liver function is. Um, in terms of the medication otherwise, I guess I should say that with all seizure medications, they all come with, I guess I always call them the big four common side effects. Um, they can cause nausea, vomiting, um, somnolence, double vision, blurred vision, so visual changes in general, and problems with cognition or slow, I'm sorry, slow processing. Um, and that's just all the anticonvulsants in general that can do that. They all do it to varying degrees. Some are worse than others, and I'll point those out as we go along as well. With just, just to clarify, with somnolence, you mean that refers to drowsiness? Oh, yeah, I apologize. Okay. Um, yeah, drowsiness. <laughs> Um, otherwise, with Depakote, um, one of the other big things with it is that it can be a medication that we found to be harmful to the fetus, the unborn baby. Um, so women of childbearing age, we tend to avoid putting them on this medication. Um, there are lots of women that have had perfectly normal kids with the medication, but just sort of as a, um, we just try to stay alert of that if we have women of childbearing age, we may switch them to something different. Um, the next medication I'll discuss is primadone, mycelene. Um, it's a medication that it's used probably less commonly now than before. It's used more so in other disorders, more so movement disorders, um, tremor, um, things like that. It's a medication that once it's taken, it gets broken down into one component and then also phenobarbital. 
So it's a medication that has a lot of the same characteristics and side effects as phenobarbital. Um, so I'll discuss that one along with it. Phenobarbital has been along, around for, oh, probably a good 50 to 60 years. Um, it's a medication that initially that was one of the only ones we had. Um, so lots of people who've had epilepsy since they were young, um, they may have been on it at some point or another. These days we still use it a bit for neonatal patients, uh, babies, um, and sometimes for febrile seizures. But I think um, in the pediatric population, we're starting to move away from that a bit more as well. I don't treat any pediatric patients personally, but my pediatric neurologist colleagues, they don't tend to use it as much these days. There are still some adult patients that are on it. It tends to be a medication that once you're on it, people tend to stay on it um, longer term just because it tends to be very difficult and a lengthy process to get you off of it. There are lots of other medications that we have now that are better, um, so in patients that are not quite controlled, sometimes this will be one of the ones we look at discontinuing. Phenobarbital, because of the way it acts and the way that the body responds to it, tends to take a long time to discontinue. So that may be on the order of months or even years, depending on how long a patient may have been on it. Um, biggest side effects with phenobarbital is that it can be very sedating. Um, depending on the dose, some patients may tolerate it well, but that's one of the biggest complaints that we have. And for primidone or mycelene, the same would apply. The newer anticonvulsants that are um, broad spectrum, so that apply towards several different seizure types, include lamictal or lamotrigine. Lamictal has been around for quite a few years now, too. Um, it's a medication that is actually one of the preferred choices for women of childbearing age. As I mentioned before, valproic acid is one that we know can cause it first or bad effects to the um, to the unborn child. There are a few other ones that we know can have negative effects as well. And lamictal has been one that's been proven through the um, anti-epileptic drug registry to be less less of a risk towards the unborn child. All the medications can cause an increased risk above that of the general population, but of the ones that we use, this is the one that poses the least amount of risk according to the studies. Um, Lamictal is a medication that's dosed um, twice a day typically. There is an extended release version that you take once a day. Um, the main side effect with this one is that it can cause a, a skin reaction, um, something called Steven Johnson syndrome. Um, it's a rash that appears a, a, amongst the, um, pretty much across the entire body. It may start in one place sometimes and then spread. The problem with the rash is that it can progress and become fatal in some cases. Um, with that knowledge, we've actually found ways around the rash. Um, it's usually tied to having the medication increase too fast. So with this medication, we tend to go very, very slow in starting the medication and getting it up to the goal dose. With seizure medications in general, because they do come along with the side effects I mentioned before, we always try to start low and go slow. So we start at the lowest dose possible and then give you a schedule to slowly titrate or increase the medication over the course of weeks. And with Lamictal, sometimes it may take a month or two to get you up to the gold dose. With that medication, um, that's usually the biggest hindrance if it's a situation where we want to have something that acts a bit quicker um, because you have to go slowly with Lamictal. We may not get the response we need or have the time to wait for it to actually, um, before you get to the gold dose, be effective. So some, in some cases, it's not as beneficial. Um, but in terms of side effects, it's probably one of our cleaner drugs in terms of side effect profile. Um, it tends to have less sedating factors to it. Um, not a lot of people complain about the blurred vision, double vision, feeling off balance. Um, so it's a, probably one of my favorite medications. Um, the next medication we'll talk about is Keppra, Levetiracetam. Keppra has been around um, probably a good 10 to 15 years. Um, it's a medication that's broad spectrum as well, so you can treat multiple different seizure types with it. It's taken twice a day, although there is a an extended release version for that one as well that you take once a day. Um, in general, there are not a ton of additional side effects reported with Keppra. However, there is, I guess more so in my patient population here in um, Kalamazoo, we've seen quite a few patients that have behavioral changes, mood changes, sometimes personality changes, and in one case, psychosis. Um, 
that's one of the things that we know can happen with the medication. I think in terms of its broad use across the country and the world, it may not be seen as often, but for some reason in Kalamazoo we're seeing a bit more of that. Side effect-wise, um, fatigue or um, drowsiness has been reported with Kefir as well. For the patients that I've treated with it, it tends to be a little bit less common, but that is still a possibility. Um, the next medication, actually, let's go back to Kepra for a second. One of the other benefits of using Kepra is that it actually is um, it's broken down by the kidneys as opposed to the liver. A lot of the drugs, actually, the majority of the drugs that we have for seizure treatment usually go by way of the um, liver in terms of um, their metabolism or their um, the way they're broken down. For people with liver dysfunction, liver problems, that can actually pose a bit of a challenge to use some um, of the other medications with them. Sometimes dose adjustments can be made, but in general, if there's a liver problem, we try to avoid a lot of the medications, and so Kepra may be one that we go to. Um, another benefit of Kepra is that it can be used. Um, it's, it comes in an IV formulation, so you can give it through the, um, the IV in the hospital. We use it for status epilepticus, so that's just the, the recurrent seizures that can happen without return to baseline in between or prolonged seizures that we can't break. Um, I think there's probably another talk on status at some point, so we won't go further with that. Um, Topamax is the next medication to pyramate um, that we'll talk about. Topamax is a medication that, again, it's a broad-spectrum medication used for lots of different seizure types. Um, in terms of side effects, one of the bigger side effects that I've seen with that is um, people tend to have lots of problems with concentrating and thought processing. People feel really slow on the medication sometimes, even at low doses. Others tolerate it perfectly fine, but, again, that tends to be, the, for me, the um, if there is a complaint about topiramate, it's going to be regarding their um, thought process. It can also cause an increased risk of kidney stones, more so in people that are at high risk of having kidney stones, but that's one of the things that we look out for when we um, discuss the appropriateness of seizure medications with patients. We want to know if you're someone that has kidney stones and that may be one medication that we avoid or we we'll monitor you closer, closely for if we decided it was a better option for you. Um, Zanisamide, Zonogran, it's a medication that's similar in a lot of ways to Topamax. Um, it's taken once a day for the most part. There are some people that are on twice a day or even three times a day of uh, zanisamide, but the way it works, it's usually not necessary to be on it that many times per day. Um, it actually doesn't come along with a lot of side effects that I'm aware of other than the, the, sort of the common side effects I discussed initially, so the thought process flowing, the fatigue, double vision, blurred vision things like that, and that's usually when the medication is initially started. As the body gets used to these medications, those side effects tend to go away. Um, Zanisamide can also increase the risk of kidney stones, um, similar to Topamax. So, again, if, if you're a person that's prone to having kidney stones, it may be a medication that we try to avoid. Banzo or rafinamide, um, actually I'm going to move to a to the end of the list just because it's more of a special medication that we use. Um, Velvetol, Velvamate, you know, it's a medication that's been around um, probably at least 20 years now. It actually, there's a, a warning that goes along with it now um, because we know it can cause something that we call aplastic anemia. Um, what that is is suppression or um, it, it changes the bone marrow's ability to generate blood cells. So the white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, they come from the marrow, which is inside the long bone. This medication can cause that marrow to not function appropriately. And when that happens, you don't produce red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Not having those different cell types can cause anemia, um, which is basically low blood counts. It can cause problems with infection, um, lots of different fancy words are used for that, and then problems with clotting if your platelets are low. This has been fatal in several cases. Uh, people have died from this. So it, would, it was actually taken off the market for several years and then reintroduced with this warning. We tend to use it as a last resort in a lot of patients. Um, 
it's because it does carry those risks. And when we do use it, um, we do tend to have very aggressive um, monitoring of blood counts, blood levels, to be sure that the patient doesn't have any problems with this aplastic anemia. One of the other problems that we can see um, liver problems, liver dysfunction, and so we monitor that closely as well. The next medication um, on our list is Potiga, um, Ezogabine. It's a newer medication. Um, actually, I'd probably move it to our partial seizure list more so just because it has been shown to be broad spectrum in clinical trials, but according to the FDA, so the, um, I guess the governing body that approves our medications for use, they've actually approved it as add-on therapy for partial seizures. So while it's a good medication in clinical trials, I think um, it still hasn't gained that official seal of approval from the FDA just yet. It's a medication that um, was approved probably two to three years ago. Um, I don't use a lot of it myself. I just haven't had an, enough patients that I've gotten to that point yet. Um, it's not a not a last resort medication like Felbamate. It's just one that I haven't seen a lot. Um, it's a medication that comes along with about a 2% risk of urinary um, retention, so basically an inability to, inability or um, lack of sensation that you need to empty your bladder. In some patients, this went away on its own. Um, most, most patients didn't have to stop the medication. They continued on it. I haven't seen that happen again. I probably only have three or four patients on it so far just because, again, I just, some, med some people have other medications that we can try to improve the dosage of before I start to go to other medications. Potiga is a little bit different in terms of its the way it acts. Um, we won't go into that, but that's one thing that makes it really different than the other medications we have and potentially another therapy for people that have failed some of our typical um, older anticonvulsants. Um, All right, can you spell that medication? Potiga, P as in yeah. Paul, O, uh -huh. T as in Tom, I, G, A. Thank you. You're welcome. And it's Ezogabine. That's the um, generic name for it. From what I've been told, um, there are people that I, I know that use it a bit more. It's actually been very effective. The three patients I have here, we are still increasing the dose. So I can't say for sure um, which direction it's going, but overall it's been a really positive medication. Um, in October 2012, um, also a few years ago, actually, I'm sorry, just last year, um, parampanil or ficampa it was approved. It's a medication that, as far as I know, is still not available. Um, I checked online this morning and it looks like it's still not. It's a medication that was FDA approved for adjunctive use or add-on for partial seizures. It's a once-a-day medication. Um, I haven't been able to find out a lot about the side effects right now, so I guess in terms of anticonvulsants in general, we know that they, it probably comes along with those typical side effects, but in terms of anything special, um, I'm not aware of anything just yet. Um, other medications that are used primarily for partial seizures um, include a whole other list. Um, there's some medications that, although they've been approved for partial seizures, um, sometimes if they're older medications, they may be used in a more broad-spectrum manner, meaning that we may use them for multiple seizure types despite the fact that their designation is for partial seizures. On that list, Dilantin is one that has been around for a long time. Um, lots of patients with epilepsy, um, especially patients that have had epilepsy for the past 10-plus years, they've probably been on Dilantin at some point. Um, it's a medication that's really familiar to our ERs. Um, it's one that patients with seizures tend to get if they come in and we don't know what else they're on. ER docs, um, they feel very comfortable with Dilantin or Phenytoin. So, again, it's medication usually given if we thought a patient comes in in status or with seizures and we really haven't had a chance to figure out what else is going on with them. Dilantin is really effective in terms of seizure treatment, um, but it comes along with some adverse long-term consequences. Um, one of the big ones, um, it can cause what we call gingival hyperplasia. So that's basically just overgrowth of the gums. Some patients that have it, it can get really bad to the point where they actually have to go to the dentist and have it treated um, there. Other patients on Dilantin do perfectly fine and never experience that. Um, and I guess that's to be said of all of the medications and all of the side effects. 
not everyone experiences all the side effects that I may mention or that may come in the drug insert, but anytime anything's reported from and thought to be related to medication, it's listed. Um, Dilantin can also cause problems with, um, we call it cerebellar atrophy. So basically the back part of the brain that controls our balance and coordination, it can start to get smaller or shrink. And that can happen over time with using Dilantin. Um, it's something that's irreversible. So for that reason, I tend to try to get my patients off of Dilantin if I can. Some people have had such a good response to Dilantin, we have a very hard time getting them off of it. And, again, some people do perfectly fine with this medication. Um, this is Tanya. Okay, then, you said about Dilantin. Right. And could you speak up a little louder because I'm on the cell phone and I'm moving, so. Okay. You say you don't really record because that's what I I take that you know myself died lantern. It's a um, medication that it works really well, and for some okay. patients, it's the one that may work better than some others for their epilepsy type. Uh huh. Especially with dilantin, because we know that it comes along with these long-term side effects. Um, most neurologists and epileptologists. They may try to get you off of Dilantin and onto something newer that may come along with less side effects, just to reduce your risk of exposure to those things. Okay, so, did, did you say now? What was the side? I'm sorry, what was the side effect? You said probably because I've been on Dilantin for almost probably almost like 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 ten 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 years. If it works for you and you haven't had any problems, then it's probably okay. Um, uh huh. With the medication. Again, I would probably talk to your neurologist about it. Um, I'm not sure where you are or who you see. But, uh -huh. again, it's a medication that's been around for a long time, and we know that it works really well. It's just that okay. long-term side effects, we want to be sure that we keep you monitored to be sure you're not developing anything that we need to worry about. Yeah, because I know sometimes he have increased, you know, like I'm a, at present time I'm taking like 430 milligrams. I have been up as high as 480. And um, so, you know, it, it, it does fluctuate as far for, you know, um, how much, you know, um, and he does pretty good as far for monitoring of me. You know, I normally make sure that I'm always, you know, going, you know, like I'm supposed to, okay. to make sure, you know, my blood and everything is checked and stuff like that. With these medications, um, although there are certain side effects that come along with them that may not be, I guess, the best side effects to have. Um, uh -huh. Sometimes as providers, as physicians, we find that it may be the most appropriate medication for you at that time for a number of reasons. Your doctor knows you and knows what to look out for. If there's something that they're concerned about, there are lots of other medications that they can try. Um, anytime you switch medications, there is a risk of having increased seizures or um, seizure, increasing seizure frequency. So some doctors are hesitant to change medication, especially if it's working for a patient. If it's working for you and the dose uh -huh. is fine, your liver's fine, everything's fine, then okay. there's not necessarily a big push to change it. It's more so in the patients that are on medication, they're still having lots of seizures, and there are newer medications oh. that we can try that may be more beneficial. Okay, then. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you very much, yeah? Yeah, no problem. I know when I was on Dilantin myself, I had problems with uh, when I was seven years old, so this was back during the 70s, mind you. I was having problems with what was called attitudes problem. Okay. And at the same time, then they took and added, still being on Dilantin, they also added phenobarb to it. Okay. But I'm also figuring, yeah, they've maybe remixed it, gotten in better gauges of dr of the same drug now. And you are right that it is considered a emergency doctor's standby. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I almost got myself thrown out of emergency once with him trying to take after I came out of the seizure. They had to get scared because I threatened to beat the doctor. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, with seizures, sometimes, um, and I don't want to go too far into that discussion. I think that's probably another day. But sometimes after seizures, we do have patients that get a little bit agitated, um, sometimes just from confusion. I mean, you know, there's a big event that happens that you may not be familiar with where you are or what's going on because for the patient, they've missed that time frame. They don't know what happened. The last thing they remember is, you, you know, being totally perfectly fine. Right. You are so totally right. That's something that... um 
changes in personality behavior can happen, but it can also happen secondary to the seizure. So just something That's to be aware true. of. But, yeah, I, I as wanted, you say, I wanted to follow up on the um, <clears throat> the cerebellar cere- cerebellar atrophy that you uh, mentioned, just because I haven't heard of that before, and I haven't heard many doctors mention it when they talk about dilatant. And I have specifically asked about long term side effects on several of these mm-hmm. calls. And so I'm wondering, is is that something that is fairly do you routinely monitor for that in in people who have <clears throat> been on dilantin for a while? And if so, how do you do that? Is that with MRIs, or is there another way to monitor for that, or do you just look for symptoms like balance problems or coordination problems? Mainly, um, just looking for balance problems, coordination problems. The patients that um, I've seen a few patients, more so in training, that the thought is that it's probably secondary to the dilantin use. Um, on MRI, you will see that the cerebellum, the back part of the brain, has gotten smaller. And, again, that's sort of the, um, I don't want to say assumption, but that's the conclusion that we've come to is that it's probably secondary to dilantin use. In terms of monitoring for it, in all honesty, um, we don't do serial MRIs, so MRIs at certain intervals or really anything else different to look out for. It's just something that we know can happen. If you have a patient that's doing well, there's a chance that the neurologist may not change anything. Um, sometimes these things aren't really known until they happen. The patient comes in and has, you know, problems with balance and coordination. Um, that's actually how the patients that I saw, um, that's actually how they presented. They came in and, you know, they had problems with coordination, and that was really the only link that could be identified. Um, in terms of the literature, I'd actually have to go back and look. I learned that one in training, so... I'll have to go back and look and see how often it's been reported, and I'm not sure why it hasn't come up before. Right. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm wondering how many patients are even aware of that, and because I would. I've had balance problems. Okay. Oh, so have I. Well, with yeah. balance problems, the medications themselves, the way anticonvulsant medications work, they can cause balance problems when you first start them, when the dose is increased or if you're toxic is what we call it, if your dose is too high. So when those things happen, um, usually if it's when the medication is started, it tends to get better and go away. When the dose is increased, the same thing. It tends to get better and go away. When the medication dose is too high, that's usually when we'll check a level, see where you are, and if necessary, we'll bring the medication dose down a little bit to get rid of those symptoms. Um, again, I actually have a little um, handbook with me right now. I'll have to do more research on that, but again, that's something I learned in training. I'll, I'm still new at this, so there's a chance that if you hadn't heard it before, maybe there was an incorrect conclusion drawn, but again, that's oh, no, one of the I mean, things I, that... I, um, I, it's, I'm certainly not uh, an expert either, so I, I, um, and I, I know there are other <clears throat> potential long-term side effects that patients don't tend to know about, and that's why I'm always interested when, when someone mentions one. So, um, so if you I'm want always to, wondering. If you want to continue with um, uh, some of the other par- par- uh, medications used for partial seizures? Sure. If I could ask, um, do we have any other physicians on the line, or is it just I, do we have patients, patient family? Uh, patients and family members, yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, what I can say is that with... Some medications, um, the combination of medications themselves can cause some problems in some patients. We know that certain medications, um, Lamictal, along with Trileptal, Tegretol, Vimpet, which we haven't talked about those yet, but sometimes those medications and combinations can cause worsening of side effects. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the combination of drugs you're on, you may actually have a worsening of the side effects that may be minimal otherwise. Um, if you're having side effects from your medications, I would definitely recommend talking to your doctor about it. There are adjustments that can be made if they feel that um, your symptoms are from the medications or the doses or the combinations. Um, just make sure that they're aware. Sometimes we do things and we unintentionally cause problems. Um, doctors cause problems too, so... Yeah. Let us always let your doctor know if you're having any sort of problem, reaction, side effect to medication. You never just stop it. Um, you never stop any anticonvulsant cold turkey. 
but you oh, know, doctor, know. no, I'm having this problem. You know, what do you recommend we do? And there are a few different things that they may be able to try to see if they can get some of that to go away for you. Okay. Uh, do you okay. want to continue with the other medications? Sure. Um, we'll move on to carbamazepine or tecretol. It's also known as carbitrol. Um, it's a medication that's been around probably just as long as dilantin and valproic acid. Um, it's a medication that in the past has been used for more broad um, spectrum seizure types. Um, but more recently, um, we know that it aggravates certain seizure types, in particular myoclonic seizures or seizures that have a lot of twitching with them. Um, it's a medication that otherwise is well tolerated except that it can cause quite a bit of um, fatigue for some people, especially once you're on higher doses. It's recommended that at higher doses it's split into twice a day or even up to four times a day dosing, um, but somnolence or sleepiness can be one of the bigger issues with Tegretol. I'm sorry? <laughs> like 800 milligrams? Um, well, <laughs> that's getting up there, but is it 800 milligrams once a day, twice a day? Depends on how you take it. twice a day. Oh, sorry. It, that um, Neurontin is what I'm on, on top of everything else. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm and, on that one, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I that makes all four, plus I'm on two anti, um, antidepressants. Okay. So I'm on six. I, I actually take like uh, 15 uh, pills a day. Oh, wow. Oh, okay, you're Goodness. up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Plus I have two pinched nerves, so once in a while I'll take uh, Tylenol 3. Okay. Rough. So again, when, there, when you have more than one medication, um, the more medications you add, the more side effects you can potentially get um, with the medication. So with having that many medications plus the others, it's probably not unusual that you'd have some side effects. Oh, but yeah. Again, let your doctor know and see if there's anything they can do to help. Sometimes, you know, going decreasing a dose may not be an option because it may cause you to have more seizures. But yeah. work with your doctor and see what you guys can do. Um, yeah, I keep asking him for crystal meth, but he won't give him a, give me any. Yeah, I don't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> He's still keep me awake. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so we'll go back to our medications. Um, okay. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You're fine. Um, so Tegretol, Carbitrol. Um, that's, I guess that's pretty much it with those. I think I covered everything. A newer version of carbamazepine is oxcarbazepine or trileptal. Um, they actually have an extended re uh, extended release version, too, called Axtelor, XR. Um, Axtelor-Bazepine, or trileptal, is actually a component of carbamazepine. So when carbamazepine gets processed by the body, it gets broken down into um, different products, and one of them is trileptal. So um, with doing this, we actually lose a lot of or some of the side effects that carbamazepine has. Um, you have less sedation with Trileptal as opposed to Tegretol. Um, sometimes mm. some physicians may switch patients from Tegretol to Trileptal for that reason. Um, and it works really well for partial seizures. Um, side effect wise for Trileptal, um, really not a whole lot of side effects beyond um, what we've already discussed except that we, we, for all of these medications, we monitor electrolyte levels, so your sodium, potassium, magnesium, things like that. We also monitor the liver function and the kidney function that we spoke about before. With trilepto and tegretol as well, you can sometimes see a drop in the sodium level. So we do testing periodically to be sure that we don't see that happen. If that happens, we may have to take you off of that medication and put you on something different. Um, I think that's, there's probably not much else to say about axcarbazepine. It's good, for, again, for partial seizures. Um, Vimpad is the next drug on our list, leucosamide. Vimpad's a medication that's been around, oh, it came up when I was in training, so maybe maybe six years ago, six to ten possibly. Um, it's a medication that's approved for partial seizures. It's available in an IV form, which is one of the, um, I guess, important things when, it, when you deal with emergency situations. Um, we only have a few medications that are available IV. And it's one that we can use to help stop status epilepticus. 
um, so we give it in the ER and in the hospital if and when necessary. Vimpet is um, it's usually seen twice a day. In terms of side effect profile, again, it comes along Excuse with the me, standard. Sorry. Someone is um, breathing into their phone, and so if, if everyone can please mute your phone again. I'm having difficulty hearing, so uh, dial star six to mute your phone, please. So other than the typical side effects uh, for Vimpad, um, one of the things that we can see is a little bit of an increase in side effects when it's used with other medications that work in the same way, uh, mainly Trilepto, Tegretol, and Lamictal. When that starts to happen, we just make adjustments in the dose, and patients tend to do fairly well with it. Um, next on our list is pregabalin, Lyrica. Lyrica is a medication that we probably don't use as often for seizure treatment. Um, it's used, it's actually a pretty good medication for pain control, neuropathic pain, and also fibromyalgia. It's approved for use for partial seizure treatment. Um, again, main side effects include what we discussed earlier, so the problems with um, thought processing, somnolence, or sleepiness, um, blurred vision, double vision, dizziness, at, usually at lower doses or as we make medication changes, they tend to go away. Um, again, I don't see a lot of patients that are on it, um, but we will use it periodically for treatment of partial seizures. Same with Neurontin or Gabapentin. Um, there are some patients that respond really well to Gabapentin. There are others that don't. Um, the perspective on the use of Gabapentin is um, a bit varied. Some people think it, think it works really well. Other people don't think it works at all. It tends to work really well for um, pain control, um, they're also using it a lot for um, mood disorders, so psychiatry may actually prescribe it at lower doses, but they may prescribe it for treatment of um, behavioral disorders, mood disorders. Um, with gabapentin, side effect with that is typically somnolence or sleepiness. Um, that's usually about it that I'm aware of. Um, Tiagabine, Gabatril, is a medication that I've only seen it used very rarely. Um, it's approved for partial seizures as well. Um, one of the side effects with this medication can be um, a little bit more fatigue than, than in general with the medications. Um, again, approved for partial seizures. Otherwise, um, I guess I don't have a whole lot to say about tiagabine. Like I said, we don't use it a whole lot. Okay. Um, just and, for a couple of the medications we've discussed so far, um, you, you've mentioned other uh, conditions that they may be used for. Do, do you uh, often strategically select a, a medication for someone who has multiple conditions? Uh, like, for instance, Topamax can be used for migraines. So for someone who has epilepsy and migraines, would you be more likely to choose Topamax as an option? Or Can you talk about any other oh. examples of, of that where... Uh, something might be used for bipolar disorder and epilepsy or for uh, other conditions uh, and that might be associated with epilepsy. Oh, sure, and the answer to that is definitely yes. Um, when we decide which medications we should um, use for the treatment of epilepsy, we do take into account other medical problems that our patient has, other um, medications that they're taking, and any other disorders that we can sort of treat along with the seizures that we're treating. So as you mentioned, Topamax is a good medication for migraine treatment. Um, Zonagran is uh, the same thing. Sometimes we'll use that for headache treatment as well. Lamictal is a medication that we can use for seizure as well as mood disorder. Um, psychiatry prescribes it in lower doses for the treatment of depression and bipolar disorder. Um, so if we have a patient that may have some signs of depression, then that's a medication that, you know, that, that may be another reason to use it. Um, with the other medications, the Lyrica, Neurontin, if there is neuropathic pain, if there's a diabetic patient that we want to sort of get um, a bit more bang for our buck with, we can go ahead and use one of those medications along with um, typically, these are add-on therapies, so use it along with another medication to try to get seizures under control and at the same time get pain controlled. Um, as neurologists, we don't tend to diagnose patients with mood disorders. Um, in terms of, I guess, board certification, we do have some exposure to psychiatry and we know the medications. But if there's a patient that has an anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder, depression, 
um, I tend to refer the patients to a psychiatrist just because they're better equipped to handle and treat those disorders than I am. Um, again, knowing that some of my medications can actually help with those disorders, I still like to have them under a specialist in that area to be sure that we're doing everything we can. Sometimes they may actually want to do um, a bit of combination therapy where we have the patient on Lamictal and maybe they'll add a Zoloft or add a Celexa or something like that. So we try to work together to keep the patient on as little medication as possible but optimize therapy so that we're covering as much as we can. Uh, did you want to talk a little bit about some of the <clears throat> medications that have a more specialized narrow use? Sure. So um, Zorontin or ethosuximide, um, that's a medication that we tend to use only for absence seizures. So these are, um, I guess, there's a classic petty mal seizures, but the staring spells that kids tend to have, um, usually in childhood, and they outgrow them. It really only works for that type of seizure. Um, it really doesn't have any place in treatment of any of the other seizure types, like the um, partial seizures, um, some of the other generalized seizure disorders. So usually that's the medication that you see in the pediatric population and use for a short term. Um, Viabitrin or Sabral, it's a medication that's used mainly for infantile spasms. Um, it can be used for partial seizures. And it's also been approved for treatment in lennox gastaut syndrome. Um, I don't prescribe a lot of it myself. Um, it's, again, ten, it tends to be used more so in the pediatric population. One of the side effects that comes along with that is um, it can cause decreased peripheral vision. Um, there have been more studies that have been performed in the past year or two to find out who and why this occurs, um, who it occurs to and why it occurs. And... I'm not sure where we are with that right now. Um, again, I don't tend to prescribe it myself, but it's a medication that if you're if it's taken, typically the patient has to um, see an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor, periodically to be sure there's no visual changes that happen. Um, ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone. Um, that's a medication. Um, actually, ACTH is a hormone that our body produces normally but it's used in a synthetic form um, for infantile spasms. So, again, in the patient population with kids that have um, spasms, sometimes only the spasms, sometimes it progresses to more seizures, but, again, mainly reserved for the pediatric population. Not a lot of, well, in terms of side effects, I mean, anytime you take any sort of, um, it's sort of a steroid hormone um, that can come along with some weight gain, um, in kids or in the babies that they use this in, I'm not sure how often they see insomnia or problems with sleeping, irritability can happen. Um, and it used, it's usually a medication that's used for a short course and then stopped, so it's not a medication that typically you'll see an adult patient on. Um, acetazolamide or diamox, it's a medication that is used in catamenial epilepsy, so that's basically seizures that occur around the menstrual cycle. They're... Um, provoked by hormonal changes that occur within the body. Um, I don't know how often it's used anymore now. Um, there are a few other medication, um, medications that we use with catamino epilepsy or sometimes Ativan, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It's also used for headache treatment. Um, certain headache types respond really well to Diamox. So um, that's... The, those are the main medications that we use. There's another group of medications that we'll talk about last, but before we go there, are there any other questions? Is, uh, te do they still have tec uh, Tegretol XR? Is that still out on the market? Yeah, there's Tegretol, Tegretol XR, and Carbitrol. Because when I was on Tegretol XR, I was part of the experimental group or whatever on that, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a lot of hallucinations on that. Okay. And uh, I haven't heard anything about that since they took me off of it. And I was really I'm surprised right now that it's still out there. Um, hallucinations with that particular medication, um, I'm not sure how common that is. As far as my, um, I guess, experience with it, I haven't seen a lot of patients with hallucinations with carbamazepine. I was on um, that and uh, all Depakote at the same time. Okay. It's possible that with the dose, um, I'm not sure what the setting was that you were on it, 
so I can't speak a lot to why or how that happened. But with these medications, like I mentioned earlier, Keppra in particular, um, a few other ones, you can see other adverse side effects that are um, on a longer list, but they're just not as common. Yeah. Any other questions? I know, I know there are a lyrica too, another side effect, and I know a lot of people uh, mentioned that at the group meeting, but uh, they'll make you gain weight. Oh, that's true. You know, that's one thing I did miss um, in our discussion. I apologize. Um, Lyrica can make you gain weight, as can Tegretol um, and Depakote. Depakote is known for causing weight gain. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, weight loss is usually something that's promoted by things like Topamax and Zanithamide, Zanagrina and Topamax. Those tend to cause more weight loss. So in patients that have problems with eating disorders or with weight gain in general, we may, may or may not put them on any one of those medications to sort of offset that. If you have a patient that's underweight, you may want to put them on something that's going to give them a little bit more weight gain. Um, if they are um, on the bigger side and they, they have some weight loss that they'd like to um, pursue, Temple Max Zonogram may be another reason. Um, may, those, that may be another reason to go with those medications as opposed to something else. Yeah, because I gained 30 pounds when I was on that. Yeah. And um, I was never that heavy in my life. Yeah, it definitely could be medication related. Yeah, how, how Any much, other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd like to know, sorry, more about drugs that can be used for Lennox Gusto. Oh, drugs that can be used for Lennox Gusto? Mm-hmm. Um, Vigabitrin or Sabro can be used, and then there's also bands over Um I didn't speak a lot about that one. Actually, it's in our broad spectrum category, but I'd probably move it to a more specialized group. It's not a medication that we prescribe often unless we have a patient with Linux Gusto or some other convincing reason to use it. Um, not really a whole lot of side effects beyond the basic, um, the basic four, um, but it's a medication that can be definitely beneficial for patients with Linux Gusto. Another one in our list, um, in our next class of medications, the benzodiazepines, Omphi or Clobazam, that's another medication that can be quite beneficial um, for patients with Linux Gusto. And they, that's another one that's specifically, I guess, FDA approved for patients with seizures types consistent with Linux Gusto. So there are three or four medications that fall into that category um, specifically for LGS, or Linux Gusto. They, do they work well usually or not really? Um, you know, honestly, I'd say every patient is different. Um, I think it also depends on the dose and the medications that are used along with it. Some people have had one response with medications, whereas others, they don't find as well as we hope they do. Um, I'm not aware of how or why that happens. I don't know if any of us really know, um, but... That's part of the big, um, I guess, drive behind some of the research that's going on in epilepsy is figuring out if there's anything else we can detect at a cellular, at a cellular level, at the, the brain cell level, that can help us determine which medications are going to work better for which patients. Although there are patients that we can put into categories like Linus Gestalt or partial seizures or, you know, partial epilepsy, um, the patients themselves are all very individual with medications they've been on at the dose they tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked. There really isn't, at least from my limited experience, any across-the-board medication that works wonders for every patient. Mm-hmm. For some people, things work really well. For others, it's just like giving them water. Um, and, again, I don't have an answer for why that is. What we tend to do is we try the medications. We try to get you to a dose that we know works, at least according to the clinical trials that are done. It's the dose that we know has been effective to treat seizures. If we use a medication for the inappropriate length of time to see a response and we don't get that response, then the assumption is that the the medication isn't working and we'll move on to something different. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is trial and error, in all honesty. I mean, there's really no way to predict what's going to work and what doesn't. I will say with the medications for Linux Gusto, um, I think most patients do see some impact on seizure frequency. How much an impact is very variable. Some people get a lot of control. Other patients may only get a small amount of control. 
messages. Because when you say the word you control, were talking... I'm sorry. Go ahead. When you um, say the word control, you don't you don't mean that necessarily that the seizures will stop. They they just have a frequency stop. Well, when I say control, I mean um, to be completely controlled or well controlled means that the seizures have stopped. That so we've gotten the patient to the appropriate dose of the appropriate medications and they don't have any seizures. Yeah. Um, control can also mean that we're getting it under better control, meaning they've gone from having X number of seizures per day or per week to a lesser frequency of seizures. So control is more, I guess, of a spectrum. Um, typically, well, depending on the medication choice and um, who's managing the care, um, you may see, I would say for the most part, you probably see some impact on seizures but you may not get full control. You may see okay. a decrease in the frequency or maybe an increased span in between seizures, mm-hmm. but you may not get complete control or seizure oh. freedom. Okay. So that's what I mean. Mm-hmm. There was another question? Yeah. yeah. I wondered if you could, sorry, tell me, um, you were talking about the broad spectrum um, seizure medications, and I believe it was the last one you mentioned. I didn't catch the name. It was released in October 2012. It's an adjunctive use for partial seizures. That's parampanil. You saw that. Sure. P is in Paul. E uh-huh. R A M P is in Paul. A N E L. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem. And at least um, as of this morning, what I've noticed is that it still has not been made available yet. <laughs> um, I think other than chemical trials, I'm not sure if anybody else has really used it. Okay, thank you. Do, do we, You're welcome. Do you have any idea what the delay is on that since it's been approved? You know, I don't. Um, I guess I could come I'd actually talk to my mentors. Find out. Yeah. It, actually, I don't know who makes it. Um, it. It's available on the Internet as well as a few other sites. Okay. But, yeah, I'm not okay. sure what the delay is. Please spell it one more time. Okay, Parampanil. P is in Paul. Uh-huh. E R A M. P is in Paul. A N E L. Thank you. You're welcome. That's E Psi that makes that, really. That's the manufacturer. So. I'm sorry, who was it? E Psi, or E I guess it's for Um, me. yeah, let me double check. I apologize. I don't know offhand. I, don't, I can't keep up with all the names. I, I have it on a, a form, so I, oh. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, so okay. Can I can I just make one more request? Someone is, has been breathing into their phone for a while now, and and if you could either not breathe into your phone or uh, mute your line, preferably the to mute your line, the um, you just dial star six, please. Okay. All right. Um, so we will I have plenty, plenty of time for more questions, but I just wanted to make sure we uh, we can come back to questions. I just wanted to cover the benzodiazepines to make sure we get through that first. So can you talk a little bit about this class of medications and how they're used sure. in epilepsy, and then we'll talk about the individual medications. Sure. So benzodiazepines, um, they're a class of medications that work at a cellular level in, this, in similar ways. Um, there are... Several medications that fall into this category, um, from short-acting to longer-acting medications, um, they're used each in different ways at different times. Um, in terms of treatment of epilepsy, they can be medications that we give um, just to abort a seizure, to stop a seizure, or sometimes if a patient is in status, we'll give the medication. Um, other times it can be used as a daily medication, part of your daily regimen, to help keep seizures controlled. Um the first medication, um, diastat, diazepam, it's a medication, actually it's, um, this one is a rectal form, so it's a suppository that's inserted rectally, usually used as a, as a rescue drug, so if a patient goes into a cluster of seizures, um, it's a medication that the caregivers can use to stop seizures. It comes in a pill form and IV. Pill form is more known as Valium, um, and then IV diazepam that we can give. Um, again, mainly used as a rescue drug as diastat, um, less often used um, as for seizure treatment in the pill form. The benzodiazepines can be used to treat a lot of other disorders. Um, one of the ones not on our list is Xanax, and the reason that it's not on our list is because although it's in the same class, 
it's a shorter acting medication and it's not found to be as effective for seizure control because of how fast it's, the body uses it. Um, that's more of a medication that's used for anxiety disorders. But again, just to give you an idea of how many medications fall into this category, that's the reason I mentioned Xanax. Ativan is a medication that most people with epilepsy are familiar with. Um, it's one of the medications that tends to get administered when a patient has a seizure, either comes to the ER or sometimes in the hospital. It's also available in a pill form. Um, some patients take it maybe once or up to three times a day for treatment of seizures to help keep seizures under control. It's also available in a um, sublingual, so that means under the tongue, or a buckle, which is inside the cheek form. That can be used as a rescue medication. Because like I said, when patients come in with seizures to the ER, it's usually one of the first medications we give. In most institutions, um, in the treatment of status epilepticus, this group of medications is usually the first that we use. So Ativan is usually the most readily available, and that's what we give to stop seizures, to abort seizures in status. The sublingual and buccal forms, the, the ones you can give under the tongue or under the cheek, they're newer formulations that can be used at home by caregivers as a rescue medication to try to abort seizures to avoid you having to bring the patient to the hospital and having ongoing seizures. So. It's something can, can that um talk about the the uh, difference between sublingual and buccal and and in terms of the level of consciousness required to administer that i mean does does can both be administered during an actual tonic clonic seizure or can or is one more appropriate for just between seizures if the person is clustering you know in terms of um Ativan, level of consciousness. I guess the best one to use if the patient's in a generalized tonic clonic seizure is probably the buccal version, just because you're going to get a lot of teeth clenching with the generalized tonic clonic seizure. So you never want to pry the teeth apart or put anything in there. Um, sublingual goes under the tongue, so you actually have to get to the tongue in order to do that. So we always caution people against doing anything that involves trying to open the mouth. The buccal form can be used in a little syringe, so um, you just draw it up and you can squirt it right into the cheek. and it's a small amount of um, of solution, so the risk of it of aspiration or it going into your lungs is usually not a big deal um, because again, it's such a small dose. So in tonic clonic seizures, that's probably the better one to use. Um, if the patient is not in a full tonic clonic seizure, sublingual may be okay to use. It's usually a little um, what we call a wafer, um, a little circle that disintegrates, it dissolves under the tongue. So if a patient has, like, complex partial seizures or they're clustering and they're in between seizures, they're not really awake enough to swallow a pill, um, but you can still get them to follow and open their mouth and, you know, there's no risk of harm from them biting or anything, then sublingual would be adequate in those situations. Patients that I have that um, return to near baseline in between, they're at least awake and alert enough to swallow pills, then Pill forms of Ativan can be used for the same purpose to try to to disrupt those clusters. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, we've been using the pill form sublingually or buccally. Never even knew there were other formulations. Yeah, it's um they're out there. I think with the pharmacies, sometimes they don't stock some of these other uh, formulations. And as physicians, sometimes we don't know about the other formulations too. Um, the pill form, it can it will dissolve eventually. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there tend to be small pills, especially if they're low dose, like the 0.5 or um, one milligram pills. They'll dissolve, and so you can use them in the same instance. It's just the um, sublingual and buccal versions, because you don't have to wait for them to dissolve. They're already in a um, what do I want to say? A more user friendly version, I guess. They're easily absorbed by the body, and they they should work quicker. That's the reason that they are administered in those versions. You want them to be absorbed into the system faster. And they work quicker than a pill would? Hypothetically, I've actually not used the pill form in status, and I'm not sure how long it takes for the pill to to, to dissolve as opposed to the sublingual and buccal versions. And then also Pharmacy you can give it IM also. You can give it IM. Um, I don't have a lot of patients that we give the syringes and needles to to give it IM. Mm -hmm. um, the sublingual and buccal version saves you from having to go and, you know, connect the needle to the syringe and draw it up. You can just give them 
this version. The buckle version, I think, is kept in the refrigerator, and I think it's already prepared and ready to go. So that, again, shortens the time from the seizure to treatment. But that can be a drawback if you're out. <laughs> that can be a drawback if you're mm-hmm. out. That is definitely true. Mm-hmm. Definitely. How do you feel about uh, medical marijuana? <laughs> just I'm, I'm just asking. Can we hold that? Because we do. I do know somebody who's on it, and and uh, he's really never said too much about it. I, okay. I, I would like to discuss that, and and we can, but I just want to get through the benzodiazepines first, okay? So we'll, oh, okay. Uh, we'll hold that question and and uh, for a little bit later, and then we'll uh, okay we'll definitely bring that up again. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll go through the other ones um, a little quickly. Um, Medazolam or Versed. Versed is another benzodiazepine medication. Um, it's available in pill form. Um, I don't know how often it's actually prescribed that way. We use it more so in the hospital in the IV form, so it's a medication that we can give a continuous infusion um, where the patient's constantly getting the medication to help control seizures. It's also used for sedation um, to keep patients comfortable in the ICU, so not every time that it's used is it seizure-related. And um, kids, and sometimes with EMS, there's certain EMS services or the ambulance services that may have the nasal version or the muscu- or the buccal version of Versed to give to help abort seizures. So with, um, I guess, aims to help reduce the frequency of seizures in the community. So from the time the patient starts to seize, the caregiver calls EMS, the EMS gets there and then they get to the hospital. We're trying to actually shorten that time to of the, the duration of the seizure for the patient. So the quicker someone can get medication to the patient, the better. Um, so Versed is a medication that I think they use more, a bit more widespread now than before to try to treat seizures. In the pediatric population, I know intranasal Versed is used a bit more often as a rescue medication as opposed to the diastat. Um, the next one... There's clonazepam, um, clonopin. Clonopin is a medication that typically comes in pill form. I don't think it's really available in any other formulation. I think they because have to refer to, uh, Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it, it's a longer-acting um, benzodiazepine. It's one that we don't tend to use as a rescue medication because it does have a longer onset of action. It takes a little bit longer to act. But it's one that patients tend to be on... Um, usually somewhere between one and three times a day for control of seizures for maintenance therapy, so for ongoing seizure control. Um, The medication itself, um, it comes along with sedation. Um, That's probably one of the biggest complaints is that it can be quite sedating for patients. Hey. Yes. Okay. Um, Other than that... Green button right there. Okay. Other than that, um, the clonopin is... um, Oh, so it's, sometimes our Linux installed patients may be on clonopin or people with really refractory epilepsy. Clobazam is a newer, well, that's relative, I guess. It's a newer version in the U.S. Um, Amphi is the name. Frisium was another name that it was under. Um, Clobazam is also a benzodiazepine that's longer lasting. It is a medication that's been around since the 1970s in the world, but was just FDA approved here in the U.S. in the past year or so. Um, again, Anfi is the brand name of it, so not exactly generic right now. Um, patients that, I guess, have been on it, more so pediatric patients, they've been using it for Linux Gusseau syndrome for years. Um, they tend to get it from sources out of the country. Um, I don't have a lot of information beyond that on it, but it has been used in patients in the U.S. I actually have a few patients that have been on it for a long time. Um, it's a medication that is, it's usually twice a day, um, not as sedating as clonazepam for most patients. I have a few that have had a lot of fatigue on it, but for the most part, it's better, better tolerated than clonazepam, and then it's a twice a day as opposed to sometimes three times a day with clonopin. Some of my patients on clonopin, I may actually switch to Amphi or Clobazam just because it tends to be a little bit better tolerated. Um, one thing I should also say about this group of medications, the benzodiazepines, um, and I throw Xanax in there for this reason too, is because these medications do have potential for abuse and tolerance. So what that means is that, well, one, people can take more than they're supposed to, and for that reason, we it's a controlled substance. Um, it has been abused, again, more so Ativan, Xanax, um, but 
all these medications do have that potential. And then tolerance. Taking the medications long term, um, the once a day, twice a day, three times a day, the body actually gets used to those medications and you can build a tolerance and sometimes need higher doses. When the medications are discontinued, they should be discontinued very slowly. Just like any other anticonvulsant, but these in particular we know, even in patients without epilepsy, if the medication is stopped abruptly after you've been taking it for a long time, patients can go into seizures. So those are a couple of warnings in general that come along with those. Um, paradoxical reactions have also been reported. So what that means is while we think it should be sedating or that it should calm people down, it can actually do the opposite. Um, Clonopin and Ativan have both been reported in pediatric populations as well as a few adult patient, um, patients that I've seen to actually cause an increase in restlessness, increase in anxiety. Um, instead of sleeping, the patient actually stays awake all night, um, so insomnia. Um, that's not seen as often, but it is possible. Um, the last medication on our list in terms of the benzodiazepines is a medication called clorazepate or transine. It's a medication that, that was probably used more often in the past for treatment of seizures. Um, again, similar to the clonopin and Ativan as a daily medication, part of your regimen for seizure control longer term. Um, these days, I don't see a whole lot of people on it. Um, I know patients that have been on it in the past. We tend to use it more for anxiety and alcohol withdrawal these days, so not a lot of people are still on that one. In general, uh, with, with the tolerance, are, are, I, is it true that uh, Clobazam or Amphi has a slightly lower chance of tolerance than some of the others? That's my understanding. Um, I haven't used it a lot here, and it's just recently FDA approved in our in the U.S. Um, again, but it's been in the world since the 1970s. So, based oh. upon the reports from, I guess, other countries and studies there, it's the way that it's promoted is that it doesn't cause as much somnolence and it doesn't have the same level of tolerance as the other benzodiazepines. So, in that regard, it tends to be a bit safer. Um, I'd actually have to look at probably the pediatric population and talk to them and see what they've actually seen with that. I have heard that they do have that in Canada, and um, it does work very well. I have a few patients on it, um, and I've seen good results with it. I would say that, again, with any seizure medication, not everyone responds the way we hope they would. I have some patients that I've actually been able to get seizure-free after many, many years of seizures with this medication. There are other patients that they, it just it hasn't really made a whole lot of difference, or some that it's made a moderate improvement in seizure control, but there's still some seizures. My goal is seizure freedom. Um, I don't want my patient to have any side effects either, but at the same time, I try to do everything I can to decrease their seizure frequency and hopefully get them con completely controlled. With the medications that are made available to us, um, as physicians, we try to use the medications as much as we can to try to attain seizure freedom for our patients. That may mean switching out a medication or trying something new, even though the last four or five didn't work. I mean, we always try to get our patients seizure free. So it's another medication that's out there that may be beneficial for someone. Yeah, I've, I've always heard that there's no cure. I think mean, it's just, there's. I mean, you can just keep it controlled by medication and that's it. Yeah, the way that I describe anticonvulsant medications to my patients is honestly, they're a Band-Aid. Um, this is something to help stop the spread of seizures, to help keep the seizures under control so that we don't actually get um, the disruption that seizures can cause, the impairment that seizures can cause. But no, it does not fix the underlying problem. It's not a cure for epilepsy. Because I, uh, I even know people have gotten operations and... Um they're still on medication. They still have seizures once in a while. And Well, with surgery, there's lots of different kinds of surgeries, and I'm sure you guys will talk about that at some point, too. Sometimes with surgeries, um, well, the goal of surgery in general is to help get seizures under control. The goal is not to get you off of medication. So a lot of patients that have had surgery, typically they are still on medication. There are very few that come off of medication completely. The thought is that with the combination of surgery and medication, we attain seizure freedom. Um, sometimes that means the patient is on less medication than they were in the past at lower doses, but nine times out of ten, they're still going to be on medication to some degree. 
Okay. Um, right. And epilepsy surgery is actually something that may work better than just medication alone for patients with certain epilepsy types. Okay. Okay. Um, are, are there any okay. new medications in the pipeline that you're particularly optimistic about? I, I know a lot of the medications that are under development are just kind of different formulations of existing medications or <clears throat> they don't really have any new novel uh, mechani mechanisms of action. Um, but are there any there that are kind of that you're really excited to see come out and, and get on the market or get into You know, out? honestly, I'd have to be honest and say right now I'm not aware of any that are different than what you already mentioned, um, sort of different formulations of something that we've already had. So I don't think there's anything I'm particularly optimistic about um, regarding any specific medication, but in general I think as our knowledge of epilepsy grows and the reasons behind it, I think there's a lot of potential for us to come up with more specific therapies for epilepsy types. Um, for instance, now that we know more about the genetics behind certain epilepsy syndromes, you know, there's there are more targeted therapies that may be developed soon. So those are the things I'm really excited about is that, you know, as our knowledge um, improves of epilepsy, you know, there, there's more that we can probably do and maybe one day even cure it. And you also talked about um, anti-seizure medications being a band-aid, but I know there's some initial studies going on to, to look as, as to whether there are any actually any medications that could truly be anti-epileptic medications, meaning that they would actually prevent uh, epileptogenesis, which is the process whereby the brain uh, develops epilepsy. So uh, has, has there been much research on that yet? I know they even looked at some of the existing anti-seizure medications to see if they also had anti-epileptic qualities, but what, where are we at in terms of that research? Um, as far as I know, it's still under research. Um, I know with all of the medications as they are evaluated and um, sort of developed, the whole goal is to actually find medications that are anti-epileptic, um, that actually do stop the epilepsy itself, the epileptogenesis. But to my knowledge, there haven't been any that have been identified to date. Okay. Um, with certain seizure types, so post-traumatic epilepsy, epilepsy coming from um, typically brain surgery, um, patients that have aneurysms or things like that, there are patients that they will place on seizure medication sort of prophylactically. So any patient here that has brain surgery will usually be on a seven-day course of either Keppra or Dilantin or something like that. And the goal with that medication is to help prevent epileptogenesis. Um, when I can't say how well it does or doesn't work. Um, it helps to prevent early seizures, so seizures that may come from just irritability in the brain from having that procedure done. But when there tends to be some sort of neuronal injury or cell brain damage from whatever was being taken out or whatever was um, the reason for the surgery, there are patients that have what we call late seizures. So these are seizures beyond seven days. Once those seizures occur, um, they tend to be more long-standing seizures. These are patients that actually do develop epilepsy, epilepsy being just a tendency towards recurrent seizures. And it seems that the medication use in those first seven days, it doesn't really do anything to change um, the likelihood of the late seizures, the chance of the late seizures occurring. So you may not get seizures within those seven days, but there's still a chance that you may get seizures later. And right now, as far as I know, there's nothing that we found to really be able to prevent that. Okay, I want to open it up to questions. I first, I want to give first dibs though to anyone who hasn't already had a chance to ask a question. So, does anyone have a question who hasn't asked already? Well, I'd still like to know what her, you know, what she well, thinks about the medical marijuana before yeah. Yeah. we're over with. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I can't do it, but uh, because I'm sleepy enough as it is. But I just wonder, you know, what your thought about it is. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Um, honestly, my thought about it, I'm not convinced that it works. Oh. Um, in terms of actually. 
treating seizures the same way that anticonvulsant medications do. Just because, I mean, there, there's, just like there's research to support it, there's a lot of research to refute it. Yeah. Um, I think more of what happens is patients that have seizures that are induced by stress or by, under other conditions where the marijuana actually relaxes them and takes away that trigger for them, Right. That may be helpful, but I don't really think it's related to anything that the marijuana is doing to the brain. Now, I can't prove that, like I said, there's, there's studies that argue both sides of the, of the story. I've only had a few patients, well, I have a, actually I have several patients on medical marijuana. Um, I don't prescribe it myself, but they've gotten their card through other means, and, you know, they do tell me that they've taken it. One patient I had was still on Depakote at high doses, so... I have no way of knowing whether or not it was the marijuana or the Depakote that was keeping her seizures at bay. Right. Another patient I have is on medical marijuana and then also, oh, probably a couple other seizure medications, and he still has seizures. We're still trying to get the seizures under control. So even though he smokes medical marijuana, he still has seizures. Yeah. Um, the other patient I have is a bit newer. Um, he tells me that his seizures respond to certain I guess, certain strains of marijuana. There are certain ones with higher, um, I guess, chemical components than others. Not really the THC. I think he called it a CBD. Um, Right. And so he has his supplier grow a certain strain for him at higher, and it's higher in these these doses. Um, He apparently doesn't have seizures when he when he smokes it, um, if he's able to get it near him while he's having a seizure, apparently he comes out. One of my concerns, though, I've only met him once, my concern is are these truly seizures? Because there are some characteristics about the seizures that don't really sound like epilepsy to me, but I can't prove or disprove that just yet. So, yeah, without a uh, 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 – I had a seven-day EEG. Exactly. And video uh, monitoring, that's what we would need to do. Um, because – Again, I, I don't. I won't say that it's not possible. I mean, I've always been one to believe that anything's possible. Yeah. But I think it depends on the circumstances and really having a good evaluation of whether or not it works. Because everything that I've seen and read, there's so many different um, things that complicate the truth that we really don't know how well it does or doesn't work. Yeah, because I believe it for you know cancer patients and that, but I wasn't too sure about epilepsy. Right. Well, and there is one uh, epi- epi- uh, <laughs> neurologist at uh, Henry Ford's that does prescribe it. And okay. I always wondered about that. So you thank- know, it, everyone's different in their perspective. We all read research and we interpret it differently. There are things that stand out to us as maybe, you know, not sitting so well, whereas others, they may feel perfectly fine with it. And then also experience and exposure. Um, that particular position has probably, actually, I think I know who you're talking about, um, has had more exposure to medical marijuana use and has had it with more, had more patients on it. So the perspective is probably different based upon his experience as opposed to my limited experience with it. Yeah. And, I mean, you'll find that across the board in epilepsy. You know, there's some people who like certain therapies, um, be it the ketogenic diet or certain medications or medical marijuana, and there's some people who think that it has absolutely no place, um, no benefit, even on um, things like neurostimulation, the VNS. Some mm-hmm. people think oh, that yeah. it works wonders. Other people think that it, it doesn't help at all. Yeah. So, I think now, it's based upon experience and exposure. I have, I have a medical marijuana card, and mm-hmm. I, um, I, I was smoking even before I discovered the seizure. Um, and like you said, some strands of marijuana do help me. I have a problem eating, and all marijuana don't help me with my appetite, but some strands of marijuana do help me grow an appetite because some days I'll look up and it'll be 5 o'clock in the afternoon before I even thought about eating anything. Mm -hmm. I'll start getting nauseated or anything, and I'll realize I didn't eat anything. But some strands of marijuana will give me um, that appetite to eat, and my doctor did prescribe the miracle marijuana card. Okay. So it helps me, but all strands of marijuana doesn't help me. And I think that's probably that's a good point that you make is that, you know, in terms of seizure control, 
it sounds like you still had seizures despite using marijuana. And what it does for you is actually helps with your appetite as opposed to it really being, it's something that helps your overall well-being as opposed to specifically seizures. And when I'm stressed out, it do, it, when I'm stressed out and I'm worried about a lot of things, it do help me relax. Exactly. But I don't believe that it really, it, it, for, it helps me relax and not worry about, it helps me put my problems aside. Right. But as far as medical, I don't believe that it really, it just helps me relax a little bit. And like I say, it helps me with my appetite. Right. And that's what I, I kind of gotten that from other patients too, that it seems to help with sort of your overall, like the overall well-being, your overall state of mind, your stress levels, with you, your appetite. So it helps you um, feel better versus when patients are stressed out or not eating well, not sleeping well. There are different things that trigger their seizure. That produce, it um, increases their likelihood that they'll have a seizure. So by controlling all these other things around them or in them, that may actually indirectly help their seizures, but it's not the marijuana itself having, a, um, I guess, a property in it that actually stops the seizure. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other, yeah. Other so, sir, that's kind of my idea about it. Because I, 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 I kind of think I'm getting too old for the marijuana, you know. But like I said, it do help with the appetite sometimes, some different strands. Yeah, I understand. Um, uh, we have just a couple more minutes, so I want to ask anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question. If you have I would like to. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you just fine. Yeah, Thank nice. you. Um. I'm on four kinds of medications. Do that with these all. I'm getting weaker. Okay. And um, I don't know if it's my age or the medications that I'm on. Okay, and so you said you're on four different medications, and you find that you're getting weaker. Yes. Is it weakness that? that's restricted to one side of the body or the other, or is this just sort of an overall feeling of weakness? Oh, over and just the whole body weakness. Okay. We call that uh, generalized fatigue or malaise or basically just fancy terminology for saying that, you know, overall you just don't feel as strong as you should or as, um, what do I want to say, as alert as you should to a certain degree. Um, it can be from medication, um, the medications themselves, like I said, they come along with the fatigue factors. You know, that's a big part of what happens with these medications just because of the way they work. People tend to get used to them, but when you have medications, multiple medications and higher doses, that can cause that to be a little bit more prominent. Um, actual true muscle weakness um, usually does not happen with these medications. So while you overall feel weak, if we were to test you and examine you, your muscles probably still work pretty good. It's just that overall you just don't feel like you have the same amount of strength or energy that you, you used to. Some of that may be from age. I don't, I mean, not necessarily, I guess, just because you get older doesn't mean you have to feel weak. But if you have any other medical problems, if you take any other medications, um, those, those things can all add to that. Um, one of the biggest things that you can do is to try to exercise more without sort of build up your endurance, um, that may help you feel better and help you feel stronger, but medication-related, maybe um, also medication regimen a little bit with your doctor may be something that needs to be done. If you really feel like, you know, you just either don't have the energy or the strength to do your day-to-day -day activities to take care of yourself and your household. Yes, yeah. I work on a golf course, and I walk all the time, mm -hmm. and I push a mower. Okay. And it's just ideal. It's, a lot of people say, well, you should be in tip-top shape for all, with all the walking you do. But it's just, I don't know. It's She's trying to switch medications on me from I've been on the Benpat, and then she's trying to switch me on Trilipto. Mm -hmm. And I, this seems like I've been having problems with the switching from Dunpat to Trilepto. Well, I would definitely mention it to your doctor. Let her know that you're feeling these symptoms, um, especially since the change in medication has taken place. 
um, the one thing about exercise that's interesting is that if you are, if your body is used to doing your day-to-day routine, and that may include a lot of walking, that may not be enough for your body to really um, feel challenged. People that do a lot of walking, I mean, I have patients who say, oh, I walk around the factory all day, probably walk miles. But your body is used to that. That's sort of your baseline level of functioning for your body. You actually have to push yourself above that level to call it exercise. So while it's good that you're out walking and doing these things, it may not be enough of what your body needs. Okay. Okay. Um, Any other questions? It's about time to wrap up, but if anyone had a last question or or a quick question, you could go. When when I had a few times when I had a seizure, I had to go ER, and they said your dilantin level dropped Mm -hmm. fast. Is that normal? Um, it can happen. Dilantin mm-hmm. is a medication that we know the levels can fluctuate. Um, sometimes based upon what you eat, sometimes not. Um, there's some people that are more sensitive than others. Some people actually, their body breaks it down a bit faster than others. And to say your dilantin dropped rapidly, I'm not sure what to say about that. Um, if there wasn't anything else that changed, I'm not sure why it would have done that. And you hadn't been seen those medications or anything. Hello? Yeah. As far yeah, as I know, I, okay. I didn't miss anything, but... Okay. The um, other the other possibility is um, Dilantin is known to have lots of different interactions with other medications. So looking at your medication list, um, your doctor would need to see if there's anything that your Dilantin interacts with, and maybe that caused the level to drop when it shouldn't have. Yeah, and you might also want to check to see if, if you're on generic phenytoin or generic uh, if the manufacturer of the generic medication changed, uh, if your pills will look different, for example, that could be a different, slightly different formulation that could affect your blood levels possibly. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, I think we have to wrap up, so I want to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malone, for, for sharing your time and, and your expertise with us, and I learned a lot of great information about medications and and um, again, the the take home message here is that you know no medication works for everyone, um, and it's really important to communicate with your doctor about any anything that you suspect that might be a side effect of your medication. Cause and the, thank you. The goal is no seizures, no side effects, and even though you may not be able to get there right away, it's something you should always be working towards. So thanks again, Dr. Malone, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Bye, Rob. Bye, too.